Hello, everyone. Welcome to Community Bookstore's virtual event series. My name is Noah Mintz. I'm the store's event coordinator. Community Bookstore is celebrating over 50 years in business, and we credit the continued support of readers and writers for this milestone. So thank you all for spending the evening with us. I'm thrilled today to be collaborating once again with our friends at New York Review Books to welcome Alyssa Vallis, Irena Grudzinska gross Eric Karpolis, and Anka Mielstein for a collection of, for a discussion of Josef Chopsky's Memories of Stardobielsk, Essays Between Art and History, which is out now in Alyssa's translation and with an introduction by Irena from NYRB Classics. Now to some housekeeping, we've enabled Zoom's auto transcribe setting. So if your version of Zoom is up to date, hit the live transcript button at the bottom of your screen to enable closed captions. If you have any questions for tonight's guests, please click on the Q&A button, which is also at the bottom of your screen to submit them. We will be asking those at the end of the program, so please don't be shy. There is a chat box through which I will be posting a link to buy tonight's book if you haven't already. And one caveat for tonight is that we're all at the mercy of our home internet connections. So please bear with any technical issues that might arise. We'll try to resolve them quickly. Uh, we have a great lineup of events planned for you as we head into spring. So do check out our website, communitybookstore.net. Sign up for our newsletter to stay up to date. One that I want to point out in particular is next Wednesday, March 9th. We're thrilled to welcome Wyatt Mason, Ruth Margolet, Sam Sachs and Mark Haber for a panel discussion of Jan Foss's Septology in partnership with the Norwegian Consulate in New York, Third Place Books in Seattle, and Brazos Bookstore in Houston. That program is up on our website now and taking registrations. So now, a little about tonight's guests and we'll get started. Alyssa Vallis is the author of three books of poetry and many translations, of which Our Life Grows, Poems of Richard Krinicki, uh, uh, was awarded the Scalione Award of the Modern Language Association. She's a lecturer in the Holocaust, Genocide, and Human Rights Studies program of the Elie Wiesel Center at Boston University. Irena Grudzinska Gross is moderating tonight's discussion. Uh, her books include Czeslav Milos and Josef Brodsky, Fellowship of Poets, and The Scar of Revolution, Tocqueville, Christine, and the Romantic Imagination. She lives in Brooklyn, New York. Eric Karpolis is a painter, writer, and translator. He is the author of Almost Nothing, The 20th Century Art and Life of Josef Chopsky. Produced, uh, he produced an artist's monograph, Josef Chopsky, An Apprenticeship of Looking, and translated Chopsky's Lost Time, Lectures on Proust in a Prison Camp. His comprehensive guide, Paintings in Proust, considers, uh, considers the intersection of liter literary and visual aesthetics in the work of the great French novelist. And Anka Milstein has published 11 books of biographies and essays. She has been awarded the Goncourt Prize of Biography and has twice received the History Prize of the French Academy. Her latest work, A Biography of Pissarro, will be published in France and in the fall and in 2023 in the United States. So now without any further ado, I will hand it off to you for it. The screen is yours. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I will be in uh, moderating this conversation, uh, I just want to say that we are going to be talking um, for about 10 minutes, all of, the, all of the speakers, and then we are going to have a conversation and after that, I'll answer your questions or comments. Uh, I would like to start with uh, saying just a few words about the author of this book, uh, Józef Czapski, who mm, is a person not as well known as he should be and which we hope uh, is going to be after this third publication already in the, in the New York Re Review of Books series. Uh, he uh, was born in uh, 18, he's a Polish, he was a Polish uh, writer and especially painter, most of all painter. He was born in 1896 uh, in Prague, uh, in a castle of belonging to his uh, family of his mother. Uh, he died almost a century later in 1993 in Paris, in a little room somewhere outside of Paris, actually, even not so centrally located. So he lived a, a, almost a century, a, a very important century it was too, and difficult. He came from um, Eastern part 
of Poland, though he was a member of a family which was uh, very cosmopolitan. But what is important for us, especially today, that we are going to be talking about a book that is uh, composed of texts that are written about or linked to Russia, uh, we need to say that he, uh, the childhood of Czapski passed in what is today Belarus, uh, close to Minsk, that he was, his most uh, important education that he received as a young man, as a, as a child, as a young man in schools uh, was Russian education. He was in Russian schools. And uh, he, uh, his first uh, intellectual and uh, political and uh, spiritual interests were inspired, inspired by Russia. Uh, he, as I said at the beginning, he was a Polish uh, uh, painter and writer, uh, but he was very, so very much influenced by Russia. It's a wonderful, I think, example of uh, the um, complicated cultural and uh, historical uh, interchanges between the various cultures of that part of uh, Europe. Throughout his life, he was very supportive of the independence of Ukraine. Uh, he, uh, I, I'm not going to really talk about it too long, but I want to mention it because we are all, of course, today uh, aware of the terrible invasion of Ukraine by, uh, by Russia. Uh, he was, a, uh, Chapsky was a product of uh, uh, this kind, in a way, resistance and to the Russian Empire and uh, of solidarity with other nationalities mm -hmm. uh, that uh, were trying to be either independent or at least not uh, kind of worked upon. Uh, so he, he, throughout his life, as I said, he was thinking about Ukraine. And he, especially, I wanted to mention that in 1977, he signed a very important uh, declaration. This was 1977, so this was the, during Cold War, a, a declaration of editors of emigre publications from that part of the world that was demanding uh, respect and independence of Ukraine already at, at that time. Uh, and I, another thing that I wanted to mention before we continue talking about him and about the book is that in the Na National Museum of uh, Lviv, the city on the west of uh, Ukraine and so far not bombed as yet, uh, there are paintings of Chapsky and that this museum is in danger and uh, his paintings uh, as well. Uh, so this is my introduction. And uh, I would like to start by asking uh, Alisa Valles to tell us uh, something about whatever you find the most important about the book and, uh, and the author. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> thank you so much, Irena. Thanks to everyone at the community bookstore um, and all the wonderful people at New York Review of Books um, for nurturing this uh, particular um, chapter in the Chapsky um, saga. Um, especially Irena um, for agreeing to write uh, the, the introduction and, and thanks to Eric and uh, Anka for joining us to talk about this wonderful man. Um, I just wanna say a couple of brief things about how I came to Chapsky and, and what this book is. Um, so there are many paths to Chapsky. I came to him uh, via a trail left by poets. I think I first came across his name in a footnote to a poem by Anna Akhmatova, who met Chapsky in the middle of the Second World War in evacuation in Central Asia. Um, and then in dedications um, by all my uh, dearest poets, Alexander Vats, Zbigniew Herbert, 
and um, a poem by uh, Adam Zagajewski, um, who was my teacher and who first handed me a book of Chapsky's essays um, not long after September 11, uh, 2001, so uh, more than 20 years ago now, um, saying that at the time, um, among many other things, Chopsky was a good antidote to political hysteria. Um, and I found this to, to be more and more true the more, I, more time I spent with Chopsky as a reader and when I started to translate his, his writing, he was someone whose independence of judgment um, was rooted in uh, acute observation, um, both of, of beauty and of, of cruelty. Um, and Adam, I remember, called him a tuning fork. He was someone, uh, he remains someone who doesn't tell you what to play, but um, can help you not to sound false notes. Um, so it's this uh, immunity to, to um, ideology and, and fashion for that matter, um, which, which I find um, at the moment most precious and compelling about Chopsky. Um, Eric has written beautifully about his art, um, so I won't say very much about that. Um, to me, he's a figure a little um, similar to George Orwell in the political sense, uh, someone who um, you know, had a, 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 a stubborn will to tell the truth um, uh, and uh, see uh, his, his, historical events clearly as they took place. Orwell, in fact, met Chopsky in 1946, just after the war, and tried for a time uh, with, with the characteristic generosity to, to, to find a, a publisher in England for this um, text, Memories of Starobielsk. Um, there's a touching exchange of letters between Orwell and Arthur Kessler, um, in which they discuss uh, the, the, the phenomenon of Chopsky and the difficulty of finding a publisher for this text. So, um, so what is it? It's, um, it's essentially the, the story of a group of Polish officers taken prisoner um, by the Soviets in 1939, um, uh, not long after, only a few weeks after the Soviets invaded Poland from the east. Um, and uh, this, of course, uh, several weeks after the Nazis invaded Poland from the west. Um, so Chapsky found himself in 1939 um, in, a, in a, uh, an abandoned uh, convent in eastern Ukraine. In fact, Starobielsk is now technically in the Luhansk People's Republic. Um, as Putin likes to call it. Um, at the time, it was a place where uh, 4,000, roughly 4,000 men were kept until the Soviets decided what to do with them. Um, now we know that what they decided to do with them was to, to um, carry out um, a, a mass execution of not only of these thousands of men in Sarobielsk, but of the entire um, sort of top of the, the Polish army. Um, at the time Chopsky wrote this um, text, which is only about 50 pages, um, it, this was 1943. He was with the Polish army in the Middle East, waiting to be uh, uh, sent to Italy to fight. This was after the Polish army uh, was constituted in the Soviet Union um, of uh, men you know, recently released from prisons, prison camps and, and from the Gulag. Um, so with this uh, bedra bedraggled army, um, Chopsky found himself in the Middle East and he wrote a short piece, um, a short memoir about this camp, uh, largely, as he said, to um, tell the, the, the families of these men with whom he had been in the camp where they had been last seen, um, to, 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 to mark the place in a sense, to, to let them know that they, that's, that's where they were last um, seen before they vanished into thin air. Um, Around the, at the same time, um, in 1943, uh, one of the mass graves at Katyn was found. But when he wrote this uh, piece, Chopsky, the, the word Katyn doesn't occur in it. He, he didn't yet know about those graves. Um, so, Spomnienie Starobielskie can be translated in different ways. I translated it as Memories of Starobielsk because it's not only, although it is notably, uh, a kind of witness uh, statement about, about these men, these vanished men. Um, it's also in its own way a reflection on memory as a moral source in extreme conditions. The, the piece contains Chapsky's own reflections um, on uh, the role that involuntary memory can play in, in keeping the, um, maintaining inner freedom uh, when faced with, you know, external violence. Um, 
it should be said that the story of Sarobielsk is is uh, still unfinished. Uh, there's there are historians at um, the Memorial Society in Russia working on establishing exactly um, publishing a book of memory um, in which all the the men uh, are are listed with their with their the date and, and place of their death um, because the Russians have not opened up uh, the NKVD documents archives. Um, this has still not been possible after um, after all these years, um, and in fact, the acknowledgement that the that the Polish men had been killed by the Soviets was didn't come until the fall of the Soviet Union itself in 1990. Um, so, one thing I wanted to say is that, as Orwell remarked to Kessler, um, it's uh, Starobiesk is an awkward length; it's about 50 pages, and uh, it seemed to me right to bring out. Um, the, uh, the richness of, of Chopsky's engagement with Russian culture, his, um, his, his entire history, uh, rather than just focusing on um, the, those Soviets who were um, keeping him a prisoner in uh, 1939 and, and 1940, he always defended um, maintaining a, a connection with, with the um, deep uh, resources of Russian literature and, and art. Um, in the face of what whatever tyrant happened to be uh, in uh, in control of the political state, um, so this book includes essays about Ahmatova Blok, um, the poets um, that mattered most to him, I believe, if, in Russia, um, uh, the painter uh, Chaim Sutin, who was one of Chapsky's great uh, loves, and um, and it contains a beautiful recollection of his youth in, in Petersburg um, at the time of the revolution, which he witnessed. Um, and, you know, his quixotic um, attempt at the time to, to lead a life of Tolstoyan pacifism uh, at the very moment when history was being turned upside down. Uh, so the, these are all extraordinary writings. Um, and it's, it's been a great pleasure to collect them all in one book. Um, I just wanted to finish by reading one page from the book. Um, so that Chopsky's voice can sound for a moment. This is from Memories of Starobiesk, towards the end. <clears throat> Very soon after arriving in the camp, I developed a lung infection. With a high fever, spitting blood, I made my way to the sick bay. I had been told, as if in a fairy tale, that there was a bathroom there, that you could have a proper bath. And indeed, I was led to a little room with a bathtub. However, the tub leaked, and in it stood a bowl with barely lukewarm water. That was it. Nonetheless, I was given a clean shirt, and when they put me in a little room with five other consumption patients, I felt as if I was virtually in paradise. We were treated by friends, by Polish doctors, and one young Bolshevik doctor, a caring and intelligent woman whom all the patients remember with gratitude. It sounds odd, but I have to admit that those three or four weeks I spent in the hospital were almost happy. From the beginning, my high fever gave me a kind of memory euphoria, a constant communion with those I'd left behind in Poland. I drew up an account of my life, which seemed to me already over, and with a heart filled with gratitude and tenderness for my loved ones, of whom I didn't even know then whether they had perished, I lived in a world of cherished memories. Those days were a contradiction of Dante's oft-quoted words, nessun maggior do dolore che re re ricordarsi del tempo felice nella miseria. After relentless nervous tension, after days of rough treatment and life in a dense, lice-written crowd of despairing men, I could lie there unmoving in a clean shirt in a little room where there were five of us, not a hundred. Then the fever began to fall, my strength came back. I decided to save myself from mental degeneration and in the evenings when my colleagues were asleep, I attempted to write from memory a history of painting from David to our times. My history, which barely led up to the Fontainebleau School or Courbet, was written in tiny pencil script in a notebook that I later lost in a prison car, somewhere bet between Starobielsk and Gizovitz. But even so, it did me a lot of good because working on it 
brought many memories back. Intellectual work without books or notes is a completely different experience from work in normal conditions. What Proust called involuntary memory and considered the one true source of any literary creation acts much more powerfully. After a certain time, facts and details float to the surface that you had no idea were stored up somewhere in the folds of your brain. At the same time, those memories that seem to grow from your subconscious mind are more fused, organically connected and more personal. I lay there on my narrow bed next to a patient whose fever remained constant. He had degenerative consumption in an extremely severe form. He was Major Kopatowski. He'd fought in the previous war with the Polish forces in Siberia. He'd been awarded the Virtuti Militari in, 20, in, 20, in 1920. He knew all of Siberia and had returned to Poland via Japan and India. I've known few people who told me the story of their lives so interestingly and simply. I had the impression that this worn out man already so close to death had an uninhibited need to tell me everything he had lived through and experienced. He had left a wife and little son behind in Poland. I tell you, my, eye, my son has eyes like precious stones. And when he spoke of his son, you couldn't hold him back anymore. His health was worse and worse. He had no news of his family. He grew more and more sad and his haggard, fever-consumed face, triangular, a little bird-like, with beautiful black eyes, wasted away more every day. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Alisa. Uh, I wanted to uh, mention now that uh, something that I should have uh, said at the beginning is that the book uh, has uh, two dedications because we had a very bad luck of uh, two people very much linked to this project died suddenly. One was Wojciech Karpiński, uh, who was a friend of, uh, of Czapski and who was the person who probably wrote about Czapski the most. And uh, the second person was Adam Zagajewski that uh, uh, Alisa mentioned as the person who really uh, was the inspiration. I mean, the first, the moving person for this, uh, for this book. So uh, thank you again. And uh, Eric, uh, maybe now you can say uh, what you think uh, is important about the book or or, or about uh, the painter, or about the person. You know his life uh, very well. You wrote, a, you wrote a very amazing biography of Czapski. Well, thank you very much, Irena, and thank you, Alisa. I think this book is uh, um, a tribute to the growing interest in Czapski um, I think I tip my hat to the New York Review books. Um, and um, I got the feeling as both of you were speaking before me that there is Chopsky's world is so large, both internally and externally as a, um, a person in history, as well as a man in a private life that you feel as people are talking, there's so much to say and yet when I find when Alyssa read from his journal, his voice comes out so clearly and so powerfully. And, uh, and this book is like that. It's, it's a, you hear the voice of the man. Mm. I wrote a biography, uh, which included many uh, facets of his life. Uh, he, was, uh, he has uh, a range of interests and of people that he knew that's simply incredible. And yet the people who are around him now who continue are also incredible people who, who draw strength from his example. And so I'm glad you mentioned Adam and Wojtek uh, because they certainly in my journey were very important as well. Um, the essays in the book um, include several essays that Chapsky wrote when he was in Russia about painting. And um, 
they are extremely poignant because in fact, Chopsky was thinking about what it was going to be like in 1941 and 1943. He was projecting what it was like to be able to get back into his studio and paint again. And in fact, it would be nearly a decade before he was able to pick up his regular discipline and routine of, of, as a painter. Um, and I find that uh, they are so beautifully written and so persuasive. And yet at the same time, um, they recognize the fact that you can't be a painter as Chapsky is always quoting Cezanne saying, you know, only paint with a palette in your hand that you can't, you can't um, talk about painting too much. You just have to really attack it. And he knew very well that it was unlikely that he would have the time to do that. And in this, um, I'm gonna just read a list of words. In one of the first essays uh, called this, uh, The Speed and Quality of the Work. This is written in 1943. Chapsky was already in the Middle East. He had already been released from prison camp, joined the new Polish army, trekked across the whole Iraq and Iran. And um, he was um, uh, all of a sudden on a train and with a notebook, which he always had in hand. And he was writing about, thinking about what it's like to be a painter, putting himself in that situation. And yet these are the words, this is a, an essay of five or six pages. And these words consistently appear. Failed canvas, constant failure, falling short, laziness, falsify the work, hated, weakness, difficulty, disgust for my own work, for your own work, powerlessness, terrible chaos, log jams, brain thoughts. So these are, um, you, know, you think in all of this, Alyssa, were you going to say something? No, I'm just laughing. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, this gives you an idea of a man who's in total conflict about his own relationship to his who he is, because he's so full of doubt of himself as a painter, and yet so confident in writing about the role of the artist and what the artist must do in order to sacrifice his life to quality in painting and to, to, to create a discipline that is so internal. Um, and yet he's writing about this as if he's writing a fairy tale because he knows that this is not something that he will be able to engage with himself. And so um, the other, some of the other essays in the book which come later uh, and uh, there's the, the essay, especially on Soutine, I think is one of the great uh, essays about a painter without being specifically about painting, but about how a painter lives and how a painter fits into a hierarchy of relationships, both with those who are alive and those who are long gone, uh, in terms of find, you know, Soutine, um, habitually painted on top of 17th century canvases that he found at the flea market. Uh, and there's that link, that kind of direct link to the past that Chapsky also had. Chapsky came, came, came of age as a painter in the mid, middle of the century when uh, abstraction, non-representational abstraction was kind of the major force of, of painting in the world. Uh, in Paris, there was uh, um, a resistance to figuration uh, and Chapsky was determined to keep a, a contact with the, with the real world. And you feel these, uh, you feel that in, in the, the memories of Starobius where he's talking about the, the blades of grass that he's looking at and he's looking out on the world. And, and he says how important it is, how any painter has to uh, paint as dryly as he can uh, meaning that he, he, he suppresses his own personality in relation to the world around him that he sees. So uh, he was painting in the middle of the century and devoted to what he could see. Uh, and um, I think that 
there is a way in which his vision um, was very unusual at that time. And he was able to, nobody has yet mentioned the fact that he kept diaries, he kept a journal. When he died, there were 300 volumes of these journals, which were full of his writings, full of sketches that he did. He always had a pencil and a pad in hand and he would often take the drawings and then glue them into his, the pages of his diary. This is about a relationship of, um, of, of mind and vision. And Chapsky is at the perfect intersection of, um, of a brilliant thinker and a, um, an aspiring painter. And this is what makes, for me, the work so exciting. Uh, and the fact that these essays give voice to uh, his predilections, his, his, his interest in other painters and how they create a life. It's a, um, it's a beautiful collection of, of uh, essays. And as uh, Alyssa said, um, because he was writing about using the past and what he's lived through, uh, about memory as a moral force. So just one further thing that I'll interject is about uh, Chapsky's relationship to Proust. Now, when he was not in Sterobust, but when he was in the, the later camp in uh, Kriyasov, he gave a series of lectures. Uh, the men were allowed to do this there, though they had not been allowed to do it in Sterobust. And like Scheherazade, night after night, he would talk about Proust and tell the story of Proust. And because he had read Proust in the 20s in Paris, as each volume, as the volumes came out, he had read Proust in French. And so he gave these lectures to his fellow Polish officers in French, because he had to process, he had to draw Proust out of nothing in the camp. And in that doing, in that drawing Proust from nothing, he was really recreating the Proustian experience, which is to take what we remember and to make positive use of it. In, in a very constructive and creative way, he was able to inspire his fellow officers with the belief that they will get through this and that, that um, that we can use the past as a ballast to get us to the present and go on to the future. Very beautiful uh, um, series of lectures. Um, uh, is that my 10 minutes? I mean, <laughs> so I'll pass it on to Anka. <laughs> yes, I, I thank you so much. I am so moved by both, both of this uh, uh, you know, I don't know what little expose is. Uh, and I'm so happy now to uh, ask uh, uh, Anka, who uh, on, the only one among us knew Chapsky, though I did meet him. I did meet him. I once climbed to his room in a uh, in little room in Paris, but I cannot say that I really, uh, really met him. And you, it seems, you knew him. Uh, in in your childhood and in in your youth. Yes. yes. Uh -huh. Yeah. I I don't even remember the first time I met him. I must have been something like ten years old. Uh, Joseph Joseph Chapsky was a friend of my father's, and they read from way back. Uh, he used to say in French, "Je suis un ami de toujours pour toujours." Mm -hmm. uh, so. Um, so after the war, he, he came, I, I mean, he was there all the time. I think he came to lunch every week. And for a child, he was not intimidating, in, in spite of the fact that he was so tall, because that was, that he could have been crushing, but he wasn't, because even with children, he, he was a listener more than a talker very often. So it's really little by little that I realized who he was, 
uh, what he had done. For us, he was a friend. And of course, he was a painter because he used to show, there was the exhibition. So this was something that was very, very real and tangible to us. And uh, after my father died, he remained, I would say he remained my friend. He continued coming every week. And when he had a show in Paris, because he lived in Maison Lafitte, which was a bit uh, out of Paris, he would stay in, in, in our house. And uh, so we, uh, he, you know, he said, uh, I'm, I'm in part of the family. And we called him we usual. We used to call him Uncle Joseph, my sisters and I. What I particularly like in, in the book we are discussing um, the juxt juxtaposition of uh, the memoirs of Starobielsk, uh, written when he was uh, 46 or 47, the number of articles that he wrote all through his life, and then this extraordinary, uh, inter it's called an interview, but it's hardly an interview because you don't have any questions from the interviewer. You, it, it, it's like a sort of or oral history. Uh, that he uh, that he told when he was uh, 71. So you have a sort of uh, tableau of his whole life. And it's it shows you uh, the diversity of his talent and uh, the, not only uh, and the quality of Chapsky as a writer. You know, you say Chapsky was a painter and a writer, but it it's not very precise to say he was a writer because you know he's there are many different kinds of writers and he used to say that for him writing was as natural as breathing but you don't always breathe in the same way so uh, this was uh, uh, he was a memoirist he was a political he was a reporter he was a political journalist he was a art critic, a literary critic, and of course, as uh, Eric said, an amazing diarist, because after all, leaving 300 volumes of diaries shows with the, the, sort, of, uh, the sort of intensity of, of, his, uh, of the, the necessity of writing every day and at every moment what he saw, actually. So the first text, the memoirs of Starobels, what really strikes me is, uh, is uh, how should I, again, I would say in French, is the la retenue. There is a sort of amazing um, um, holding back of uh, pathos, of uh, the sensational, uh, the, the, the plaintiveness. It's a very uh, uh, res restrained text. And it's not that he smooths over the, the horrors of the situation, uh, you know, the, the humiliation, uh, the, the pain of the, of the dirt, of the chaos, the arrogance, the contempt of the victors. But he, it's, not, it's not a book about suffering. And he goes out of his way to say that they were not beaten, that they were not famished. Uh, in another text, he's, he has a curious formula. He says they were, they were kept in a state of malnutrition, but not of hunger. And I wonder if the fact that Chapsky was writing this text in 1943 doesn't explain this because at that time he had heard many stories of the newly liberated Poles who had endured unimaginable sufferings in the Gulag camps. And I suppose, uh, Eric, contradict me if I'm wrong, I suppose that he had met already Gustav Herling and Gustav Herling, you know, had survived after two years in the House of the Dead in a camp near Arkhangelsk. So I think that, uh, that Chapsky didn't want to sort of add, he, that, that was not his subject. What he really wanted to do, you know, Chapsky was a very ex extraordinary man in the sense that he always noted the absurdity of things, even in, in, in a context of suffering and of tragedy. 
For instance, in Memories of Starobelsk, he does mention the interrogations that took place during the night and sometimes went longer than the night, it could last for days. And we all know how, how absolutely terrifying these sessions were. But when Chapsky talks about his own interrogations, he finds a sort of humor. He said, the problem was that my inter interrogator could not understand why I could have left Poland between the two, two wars in the 20s and the 30s, gone to Paris without alerting the authorities. How could you just go? Because after all, said the inter, you are a painter, you, you could be a spy, you could have brought back maps of Paris. Uh, Javsky said, I, I couldn't make him understand that in Paris, <coughs> you could buy a map of the city in any stationery store for two cents. So you see, Chapsky always found this sort of incongruous, this sort of detail that, that was just extraordinarily strange. And I think that was very much part of his charm as a man. He told stories and then he stopped to say, he, he never spoke much of his uh, years of captivity. There is one thing though that he came back very often that he told often was uh, the fact and it was also a sort of absurd, bizarre thing. He said, I just could never understand why when we were held prisoners at the very beginning, the loudspeakers would blare out Chopin while the Russians were telling us how insignificant Poland had was. <laughs> and he said, you know, why not Tchaikovsky? No, they were playing Chopin. So you see, they always found something uh, that uh, that was strange and in a way, very, very human. Now, uh, 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 there is also, the, but there's something else in that text. Um, you know, Gustav Herling said that Chapsky wrote it as a pole. And at first I thought that he was alluding to the fact that uh, Catholicism was so important in that text. You know, the description of the Christmas dinner, of the, of the hymn song in the barn, of the reading of the gospels. But I think there's something else because Chapsky, you sort of, you, you feel how much he regretted not having a pencil and paper because he describes his comrades and he describes them physically and actually intellectually and psychologically. And there again, you have to admire the ones he chose to describe. You, you see, he talks at length of a man called Ralski, Lieutenant Ralski, who was a professor of biology and he was so passionately interested in his subject that even during the journey to Starobielsk, and here I'll, I'll quote, when we were being driven across the snow covered Ukrainian steppes and frozen and hungry and didn't know where they were taking us, Ralski studied the steppes and the tufts of grass sticking from under the snow with a scientist's passion. This most excellent of poles the tenderest of husbands and fathers admitted to me with a certain embarrassment that those grasses filled him with such, such felicity. Whoops, I'm sorry, I, I, I dropped my, my sheet. Um, filled him with such fascination that they allowed him not only to detach himself from his immediate circumstances, but to feel profound joy gazing at the unfamiliar steps he'd always dreamed of knowing one day. This is a very curious notation. There's another man uh, who, is, who, who arrested his attention and he was called Zygmunt Mitera. He was the only Pole who had gone to America on a Rockefeller Fellowship to do a doctorate on geology engineering. We jokingly called him the gondolier because his job in the camp was to spend hours paddling with a ladle in the enormous cauldron in which they made soup for the prisoners. In the camp, this man had inexhaustible force and humor. He helped us in everything, gave lectures in geology 
and was also a terrific singer in our gatherings in the evenings. So there are many other, uh, many other uh, uh, portraits in this genre. And I think that Chomsky really was writing here as a Pole because he wants to stress the achievements of these men. And of course, their resilience, their courage, their generosity, and the cruelty of their fate, because all the portraits end with those words, he perished. So I think that you can read Memories of Starobielsk as a sort of homage to Poland, as a sort of hymn to Poland. I think that that's what I, I think that's what Hurling meant when he said that Chapsky wrote as a as a poem. Um, there is also the fact that this text is very literary, and um, I think that the literary quality comes from the fact that Chapsky always describes very precisely, but doesn't add much commentary. At one point, he describes very precisely uh, the walled courtyard where the prisoners were held uh, in a large carriage house where strange old jalopies were parked and the whole floor strewn with dirty old papers, periodicals, books from some destroyed library. In one of the walls <laughs> of the carriage house, there was a large hole made by bullets at the level of a standing man's head. We were told that it was there they had shot members of the lo local bourgeoisie in 1917. I saw a similar gunshot hole in the wall around the Starobiel's convent. Apparently nuns from the religious order had been executed there. And he doesn't add anything else. So you can see that he absolutely trusts uh, the reader's imagination. And I think that is a mark of a of great literature, actually. Now, uh, the, the Memories of Starobelsk is very well written, very thought out, very constructed. Where I, in a way, I recognize Pachapsky's voice much more in the long interview, the sort of free willing freewheeling interview that he gave uh, 30 years later, because there he doesn't rein in his natural exuberance. Chapsky was somebody who loved to tell stories and he could jump from one to another and an anecdote and this and that. He was not a, um, a corseted man, not at all. He was open. And you have this feeling in uh, the recollections. You also have the fe this sort of humor that, that comes out even in the worst circumstances. Uh, you know, he, he describes his life with his two sisters uh, during, uh, in, 1917, in 1917 in St. Petersburg. And they were starving, even though, and even though they were starving, they were trying to set up a soup kitchen for, for Russians. And then he tells an extraordinary story. And this is a story that he used to tell quite often. He said that he, they could buy uh, fish, uh, grilled fish on skewers. And uh, he and his sisters had bought four of them. And then one day, and then he realized, they realized one afternoon that they only had two. So they thought that perhaps they had been stolen and wondered who could have gone in their apartment until they noticed a hole and they noticed that a fish was being dragged in the hole by a rat. And uh, his sister, Carla, and of course, this is a typical, typical uh, Joseph, Carla was squeamish when it came to things that were not clean enough. And of course, Car Carla took the fish that was half eaten by the rats and threw it in the garbage. But Joseph was not squeamish. As soon as his sister left, the room, he took the fish out of the garbage, he sort of cleaned it and ate all the little bits of flesh that were still attached to the, to the, to the skeleton of the fish. Uh, he tells that, so he's making fun of himself, he's telling a story, and it, it's quite true that uh, he always made fun of the fact that he couldn't care 
he couldn't care less what he was eating. His sisters always said that you could feed Joseph the pig's slop and he wouldn't know the difference. And it was something that really, always made my father very sad because my father loved eating and he loved Polish food. And whenever Chapsky came for lunch, my father made an effort, you know, and made bigos and made razi and made all this Polish wonderful food. And Joseph never, never paid any, any notice. This, this wasn't at all something that interested him. But uh, in the recollections, you do find this extraordinary way of Chapsky of looking at things and making fun of himself all the time. I think I should stop if, <laughs> if, if there are questions that <laughs> this, this, this because is we've been talking about Chapsky for hours and hours. And I, so understand. I understand. I understand. Wonderful. It was wonderful. Uh, so do we, do any of uh, Alisa or Eric, would you like to say something or are we going to, ha we have this five minutes to go to the questions. I just wanted to say that this, for me, this uh, memories of, Star of Starobilsk are a monument to all of these people, truly. And because the, you know, we cannot really find them. I mean, this is the this is the memory that this is the memory that kind of a build uh, a, a, a monument made of words uh, that is uh, remaining. This is, I think, he, his intention was also of this portraits that would be like like funeral uh, photographs uh, in a way. But I would like to ask Noah to help, unless Eric, you wanted to I was speak. just going to say that um, one of the uh, roles that Chapsky played in his life was as the torchbearer of the truth of what happened to the men, uh, to the 22,000 Polish officers and cadets who, who were murdered. Um, and for the audience who might not be aware of the fact that until 1989, 1990, uh, 50 years after the, uh, the executions of these men, uh, only then did the Soviet Union acknowledge that they were responsible for the deaths of these men. And I just want to put that in a context of uh, a reference that Alyssa made to the organization called Memorial, um, which is right now struggling with the Russian government uh, that I believe the offices of Memorial had been um, um, closed down by the state security and those very uh, digital files of the information of each of these men and their history uh, were confiscated. And so this is, um, Chapsky comes to us from the past, but he's also very much with us in the present. Uh, and, and the idea that Chapsky was not somebody who was ever anti-Russian he was only ever anti-Soviet, uh, and, and that we hold that distinction ourselves these days, and uh, um, I just thought that would be helpful to add. Yes, very, very true, very true. Alisa, would you like to also to add? Well, we have so little time left, maybe we should go to questions. Sure, yeah, um, and we, we can go a few minutes late. We started a few minutes late. Um, and before I launch into the questions, thank you all so much for your insights and, and very fascinating um, discourses on Chapsky. I've, I've learned so much and very much appreciated listening to you. Uh, okay, so first question, um, I hope we can get to as many as possible. This one is directed at Elisa, but we can maybe open it up to all of you. Uh, wondering, it's from Karen Schomer. I wonder if you can offer a sense of how you experienced Chopsky's writing in the original language, um, especially having read so widely in the language, at least as a translator. Um, uh, I, I have to say, I didn't find him easy to translate. Um, I, I find his prose um, beautiful um, in all of its uh, all of its versions, as Anka um, was describing, he has he has different modes. And when he's writing about um, the man in Starobielsk, he um, keeps himself um, out of it more than than um, he does when he's writing about his own life, or indeed when he's writing about painting. Um, so there, for me, there was a great um, uh, difference 
between the experience of translating Sarabiersk and the uh, and translating everything else in the book, um, because in the in in the essays and the and the recollections later in his life, he is unleashed, and they are filled with a kind of warmth. You know, they still have that kind of sharpness and humor um, that 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 he had the, that that eye um, and the precision, um, but they also have that um, kind of um, exuberance um, uh, and um, as, as a Polish um, prose stylist I think he's unusual partly precisely because of his international and Russian um, you know partly Russian education and he doesn't write as if he's learned Polish in a schoolroom anywhere um, a lot of his writing is is um, fragmentary um, sort of it, it much of it has the quality of a diary of, of notes quickly taken um, I think that's partly what makes it so engaging so um, sort of easy to read but it also makes it for me um, it was it was a struggle for me to um, find the right kind of equivalent, um, the right kind of fluency um, in English that, that would not sound too repertorial because he never falls into repertorial cliches, um, even while he's covering a great deal of information uh, in a short space of time. Any other reflections on, on Shapsky's original, original prose in Polish? I th I find his writing beautiful, and I found it also uh, very exciting because he doesn't have the barriers uh, to to other languages. That is, he mixes whenever he finds something useful in other language, he puts it there. So you don't have this, uh, uh, you know, isolation uh, that that you have in a language otherwise. And the, the, this is a sign of what we were basically in some way talking about, that is that he is, uh, he is, uh, I, I wanted to say multicultural, but this is such a, such a word that it cannot be <laughs> really, cannot be used in this context. I mean, he is somebody who is, uh, uh, who maybe because of his height, <laughs> maybe because of his, uh, of his childhood because of the fact that he was in many places, because of his multinational family, uh, the family that was uh, Austrian, uh, German, uh, Polish, Russian, uh, that uh, because of that, he is somebody who does not, uh, you cannot limit him. You cannot really de describe him in one word. I think an example of that um, cosmopolitanism is the fact that his very father, who was a Polish aristocrat, a Polish count, only learned to speak Polish in university, that growing up Polish was not the language of the home. Uh, and so he, he, his ear was full of many, many tongues. He was uh, somebody, uh, one of these examples of people who are very patriotic and absolutely not nationalistic. That is somebody who could not understand. Uh, for him, nation was something that was enriching and not something that was enclosing. Uh, and that is why his attitude towards Russia was always an attitude of uh, love and understanding. And uh, he would have been heartbroken at what is going on now. That's lovely. Thank you all for the, that insight into, into his Polish. I imagine that college, cosmopolitanism also makes it very difficult to, to translate. Um, another question uh, from Elizabeth McLean. Uh, I would like to ask Eric uh, for, first of all, thank Eric for writing Almost Nothing, a book that, that Elizabeth admires beyond measure for how it places Chapsky's life in the context of Poland's history. Uh, is there any aspect of Chapsky's life or intellectual pursuits that needs further study? And are you pursuing it? Or is anyone here pursuing it? Well, I would say that the, um, the major uh, thrust of Chapsky studies right now is in the hope of getting his journals uh, made more widely known. And uh, right now, um, we're about to have in Polish the translation, or the, actually the deciphering, because his handwriting was so bad, but um, the publication of his uh, 
war diaries from 1940, 1944, done by uh, a Polish um, art history uh, student who is, uh, as his dissertation has, has made a study of these um, diaries. Uh, and I think the hope is that at some point, more and more of the diaries will be uh, better known. Uh, I myself, because, um, because I don't have Polish as a language, I can't really invest myself in those. Uh, but I think that there, it ruined, there's so much there and there's so much hope that uh, more people can come, become involved in making those uh, more accessible. Um, on another side, in terms of his paintings, um, there's always hope that they can become better known through exhibition. And this is uh, an uphill battle as it was during his life uh, because um, there's a certain marginal quality to the work that uh, is not seen as being in the mainstream by the art world per se. But actually his paintings are so remarkably fresh and contemporary in feel that I think if somebody makes uh, a commitment to exhibit the work and travel it around, that people will respond very strongly to, to it. That's wonderful. Um, maybe before we before we wrap up, another question about the paintings. Then, um, uh, do any of the art museums? This is from Paul Russell. Do any art museums in the United States have Trotsky's paintings in their collections or on view? Not a one. Um, there is a, a museum of Polish art in Chicago, uh, which owns a Chapsky painting, um, which they actually had to confirm with me. They weren't sure when I began my research. I knew that they had one. They didn't know that they had one. Turns out they do have one. And it, I was told that it's on display in the, um, the Polish embassy, the consul, Polish consul in Chicago. That's very good to know. May, may I interrupt one second? I just have a few drawings of Chapsky, and I thought perhaps you would want to take a look. <laughs> Thank yes, you, please. Do <laughs> you see it? Yeah. Yes. Yes. So, <laughs> this, this is a, a, perhaps, um, I, I can't see what you see. <laughs> but, uh, so this was a, a sketch done when he was traveling in Brazil. This is my sister playing the accordion in Paris in the 50s. Uh -huh. And then I wanted to show you a little landscape. So this is the cemetery where my father is buried. So I just want, I, I mean, I didn't want to show you more, but I did want to show you three examples, very different examples of the way he always was sketching and drawing. Oh, thank you so much for that. We don't often get, uh, Art exhibitions in our in our virtual events here at what? Community Bookstore. So that was a rare treat. Um, perhaps we should end there, but I want to thank you all so much uh, once again for this very insightful and fascinating conversation. Those of you at home, we hope you'll consider purchasing a copy of Memories of Starobielsk from Community Bookstore. I just put a link in the chat once again, and we hope to see you at another virtual event very soon. Thanks again, everyone, and do take care. Have a good night. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.